This conference grew out of an attempt to understand the geographies of state power, an elusive phenomenon that has vexed a lot of smart observers for a very long time. Anyone who gets to know a particular part of the world soon learns of quirks and kinks that are not fully captured by our maps. Shell regimes and shadow governments, breakaway regions and lawless zones, leased bases, contested borders, overlapping jurisdictions, legal dependencies, and subtle or not so subtle arrangements of all kinds that compromise the sovereignty of states. To learn more about these kinds of complexities, Martin Lewis and I started doing a deep dive into the literature on this subject a few years ago. In the process, we came across exciting work by scholars who were pushing the limits of cartography and cartographic analysis, doing work that illuminated the geographies of power beyond and beneath the received maps and models. It wasn't long before we started to dream, what if we could gather these thinkers together into one room for a conversation with students and friends? And not just any room, but this room, the best place we know for pouring over maps together. The result is this symposium, and it's just thrilling to know that this day has finally arrived. Most of the speakers on your program are area experts, and the contributions that we will hear during the course sessions today and tomorrow are deeply grounded in particular places that they've been studying for a long time. But the talks that open and close the conference set their sights on a broader canvas, tackling prevailing models of sovereignty head on. Our first panel, Concepts and Frameworks, offers insights from two iconoclastic social scientists. And I say that with great affection. Jordan Branch will lead us off with a talk aimed at helping us grasp what a state is in the first place. This is a long-standing interest of his, evidently. He teaches in a department of government, specializes in international relations, and has written a path-breaking book on the origins of what he calls the cartographic state. Our second speaker, Franck Billet, is an ethnographer and spatial theorist who has been ruminating for some time on the limits of cartography. Franck is unable to be with us in person today, but he has recorded a fascinating presentation on forms of power that he calls scattered, distorted, and voluminous. Each speaker will have the floor for 20 minutes, and then we will take questions from you all. Thanks so much, Jordan. Oh, it stops. <laughs> Little preview, little preview there. Takes away the surprise. So thank you so much for inviting me and for having this conference, Martin and, and Karen and everyone else involved. Um, I'm really excited to be here. What I wanna do to start with is just ask a sort of question that I think everyone in this room has asked and as many people in this room have answered in much more convincing ways than I have. To say, what is a state? That's what I'm thinking about here. Not just in general, but like there are different ways to think about what is a state. Now, this is obviously one answer that we often give. This is, a, this is the state, these are states. These are depicted on the political map of the world. These are linear boundaries. They separate homogenous territories. Every piece of land surface is claimed except of course Antarctica, which is conveniently white both for it being cold and for being not claimed by any state. This is state in its ideal typical form. This is what we tend to, I mean, at least when I teach an introductory class, at some point I'll talk about states to students to explain we're not talking about California, Oregon and so on. We're talking about countries and this is what I mean. Now, we're all here because we study maps, we study sovereignty, we're interested in these questions. And we know that this is, of course, not what a state is, or a state is so much more than this and so much less. All right, so much scholarship has problematized this relationship in really effective ways. The ways the maps have preceded the territory, the way the maps are propositions and arguments rather than communication devices. Maps are tools of state power. And many of us, when we think about the state, we say that states are not this map. The map misses so much, as Karen just alluded to in her brief opening remarks. But just for a moment, I want us to take seriously this off the cuff remark of saying, well, what is a state? A state is this. What if we say that this is the state? Now, not necessarily just this, this specific CIA World Factbook map, which has its own interesting history that other people in this room have traced much more than I have. 
But what if the state is at least in part how it is represented in things like maps? What if that is not just a tool of state power or something that has created states or has formed states, but it itself is part of the institution we think of as the state? And that's what I want to think about with this project here, that taking some elements that typically we think about as being related to states, at least those of us in this room, but not being of the state itself, and ask what will we see differently if we thought of these things as being part of the state? Now, one of these is representations, as I sort of try to think about as a broader category than just maps, although these maps obviously fit into that category. And also, as I'll mention in a minute, infrastructures, large material systems that may be how states, we think about states uh, instantiating the rule, forming borders materially, things like that. So I want to say, what I want to lay out is the way that, and it's just this outline I'm going to have up for most of my talk. And as I mentioned everyone I got here today, I didn't think about how large the screen was. And I, this is obviously everybody, everybody can read this, even people that are at the other end of the library. Um, if we think about the state being both ideas, which is, as I'll go through in a minute, is the conventional way of understanding the state, that the state is ideas. We also think that the state is its infrastructures and the state is its representations, all together in a sort of complex agglomeration. That might allow us to at least propose some slightly different ways to think about the state's emergence, the persistence of the state to today in spite of the decades of supposed state ending challenges, and then also possible alternatives, alternatives to the state in today's world. So I just, to, to one more thing to mention to start off with is that I always find my position at these sorts of conferences uh, somewhat peculiar. I mean, these are the conference kind of workshops and conferences I like to come to the most, the interdisciplinary ones, but my job in a lot of my work has been to translate work, not translate, but to bring ideas from people in this room into an audience that has not heard them before in my discipline of political science and national relations. So I'm obviously don't need to do that. I'm also not interested in being a, main, a defender of mainstream international relations or political science arguments either. So I'm gonna to try to do is lay out a sort of synthetic art idea about how we might think about the state that draws on some stuff from my field and it's stuff from a lot of other fields, not as a sort of, um, hey, here's a better definition of the state, but just as I think a sort of thought experiment. How might we see these questions about the emergence of the state, persistence of the state and so on, how might we see these differently if we tried to conceptualize the state as actually being composed of representations as, and infrastructures along with ideas? So the overall idea here is to build on some social theories around, about things like assemblages or actor networks, right? These are frankly very complicated arguments that we, I don't, I'm not really interested in getting to debates about other than the way they highlight how a host of widely varying factors from people to rules and ideas to material systems together can constitute something. I mean, that's the, the sort of core idea of things like assemblage theory or actor network theory from Bruno Latour and others. So we take that idea and we say, okay, well, maybe the state is one of these things that is actually composed of a variety of types of features. What do we see differently? So what are the three things? The ideas, infrastructure, representation. Starting with ideas, this is really where, when we think about it carefully, I think this is where definitions of the state have almost entirely been in political theory and political science, I think in sociology and history largely. There's a lot of discussions of how these ideas relate to material systems and maps and representations but the state itself is a set of ideas. And I think the easy way to see that is to look at one of the sort of uh, very commonly cited, obviously debated and critiqued definitions of the state from sociologist Max Weber. State is that human community which successfully lays claim to the monopoly of, a, of legitimate physical violence within a certain territory. Obviously it's a translation. This is one, I don't speak German, but this is one that I like. Uh, I think it makes, it seems to make sense. Now this is the kind of, um, definition that's often brought up, that's often cited. I certainly show this again to my introductory students to say, again, here, what are we talking about when we're talking about a state? Now, it doesn't really sound like this is at the level of ideas. It's about physical violence, about physical force. But if you really look at this definition, it's not about the physical force itself or the capacity to use it or the means of it. It's about ideas. This is a claim to legitimately use physical violence. And what are the limits on that within a certain territory? In other words, it's a set of ideas about legitimacy, who has the right to lay this claim and to use physical force. And it's ideas about territory, about where those claims begin and end. Now, this is of course a, a form that few actual states achieve, but nearly all states aim toward, and it certainly serves as the kind of ideal type of states in the modern world. 
And there's nothing wrong with this definition. Right? I'm not saying that we should throw these out, but it does operate at the level of ideas. Other ideas that are not quite as, uh, they're not quite the same as Max Weber's, but there are other, other definitions of states at the level of ideas that focus on things like centralization, that focus on the emergence of the ideas of territory. Again, these are about ideas. And if representations or infrastructures are discussed in these works, it's often, again, as either causes of the state, so to speak, effects of the state, tools of state power, but not as actually part of the state itself. So that's ideas. I think that's sort of a common way. Now, I, again, I don't want to throw these out. I want these to be included as part of this concept. Infrastructures, though. What do I mean by infrastructure? What do I mean? Large-scale material systems that is instantiate the ideas of what makes a state or what a state should be. This draws on a lot of work from science and technology studies and related fields that ex directly examine sort of political context of technologies, their political construction, their political effects, and so on. The kinds of systems we think about here are, are systems that are similar to what uh, scholar Chandra Mukherjee calls logistical power. The power of a state that is logistical rather than what she calls strategic, or we might just think about sort of the, the authority to command versus the capability to, in, to carry out and instantiate those commands. This could include things like communication systems, transportation networks, border enforcement systems. A nice quote from Bruno Latour got me thinking about this in this way, I think is useful. He's speaking here about the, quote, rationalization of states in the 19th century, particularly the Prussian state. The rationalization grant of bureaucracy has been attributed by mistake to the mind of bureaucrats. It is all in the files themselves. Now, Latour's point is that we talk about rationalization being this idea that these bureaucrats had this, they had this idea we should rationalize to say that's what mattered. He said, no, what mattered is their construction of these files and systems, large material systems for making that rationalization a thing. Now, I want to make a sort of more limited and more synthetic claim that rationalization is actually both in the minds of bureaucrats and in the files as well. It's neither one nor the other exclusively. I think territory and the territory is obviously core to a lot of the work here in the room today. Territory is another great example of this. The border defined nature of modern territoriality, the idea that again, states at least should, or they want to exert authority within their borders, entirely within their borders up to that line is an idea, but it also relies on infrastructures. What is state territory if we took away all of the infrastructural elements, custom posts, border walls or barriers, boundary markers, passport controls, and so on. State territory would be an idea, it would be just an idea, and it would not be have the sort of world-changing effects that we see it having today, and the, it would actually change the, quote, exceptions to it as well. So what makes the state territorial today is the combination of the hegemonic idea of boundary-defined territory with those infrastructures that enforce a material idea, those ideas, along with the representations that we're surrounded by in this room. So let's think about those representations a little bit. Those representations, of course, are what this conference is all about. So I don't need to, I think, to people in this room, justify the idea that we should be including these and keeping them in a the central focus. But my point here is that the ideas of the state, we can sort of discuss them, but they are unobservable. And these vast infrastructural systems are large and complex and difficult to grasp in their, in their entirety without some form of simplification and representation. So when the state itself is imagined and discussed and built and so on, this operates at least in part at the level of ideas, I mean, excuse me, of representations and ideas. So here are three nice examples. I think most of us are very in this room are very familiar with. A lot of people, a lot of scholars in this room have, have connected mapping to the state's characteristics, its origins and its persistence. But again, I just want as a thought experiment to say, what would we see differently if we thought about these representations also as part of the state itself? The state is its representation as much as it is ideas and infrastructures. So maps are a great example of this, right? Here we have a couple of, of very widely known, I think, examples. This is a map uh, of the so-called so logo map of the geo body of Siam or Thailand from Thin uh, Thong Chai Winnie Chakul's book on this topic, right? The nation state of Siam was not just created or shaped by these representations. In some way, the nation state of Siam, we could think about as being in these representations, these representations being part of that nation state, that national identity. Or of course, in the middle is the Cassini survey of France, one of these reproductions of the um, triangulation of the, of the edges, the coastlines and borders of France. This is the archetype of state-directed mapping historically, right? The sort of often emulated, often held up as the, the key example of this, uh, mapping for administrative purposes, then obviously upped in resolution for military purposes and a lot of other uh, uses. 
there's a lot of arguments out there about how this kind of solidified the territorial nature of the French state. But we could again flip that and think about these surveys and resulting maps as being not just something that created the state, but that are part of the French state by the 18th, 19th century. They're part of the territoriality of France. And then finally on the right, we see this is a page of the Domesday book, uh, the uh, survey of England for, by William the Conqueror from 1086, which I wanna highlight because I think that we don't have to only think about representations being visual. Now in this room, obviously that's, that's what we're gonna focus on because that's what's here and that's fantastic. But representations can take on non-visual forms as well. The, the way that my thinking has gotten pushed in this has really been due to a lot of more recent work. I've been thinking about things like the politics of the internet and how the internet has been very difficult to represent visually. And so the linguistic and conceptual representations of the internet have been extremely consequential. So in what ways are the non-visual representations of the state actually part of the state as well, right? So this, the Domesday book was part of the polity of England in 1086. It wasn't just a tool of state power. The state was, in a sense, part of the state was this survey and its reproduction. So getting back to this overall outline, again, I think this might be useful for rethinking a few questions. On the emergence of the modern state, one thing I want this concept to highlight is that often when we're talking about the origins of the state or the modern state, many different arguments are actually talking about different things often explaining what is not exactly the same aspect of the state. They're explaining different aspects of the state, but we're sort of lumping these together as being, well, I'm explaining the state because I think it was about mapping. And this is the kind of discussions I had 10 years ago when I was presenting my first project a lot. Somebody else thought it was about capitalism and property relations. Somebody else thought it was about the reformation and the, the sort of overturning of the supremacy of the, of the Pope. Now, in a sense, all those things are part of the origins of statehood today. They're actually explaining different aspects. Are they already talking about the boundary focused territoriality of the state? Are we talking about the centralization of authority? Are we talking about um, increasing bureaucratization? Are we talking about supreme authority and recognition of no authority over the state? Each one of these might have very different histories, different trajectories and so on. And what I'd like to do with this concept is to say, adding the more of these components to the state helps us understand the way that the state does not just emerge at any one moment does not emerge through just any one causal factor and helps us stop talking past each other about these different arguments. And what, the way these get presented in my field at least is that these are competing explanations for the same thing. Here's the latest review article that, that opposes economic versus military explanations for the origin of the state. Note they never actually include anything about ideas or mapping or anything like that. So that's a whole separate question. But they're often actually equally plausible, but they're explaining different elements of the state. If we think about the state as this complex agglomeration of diverse threads and, and elements. And I think that's a really helpful way to start rethinking some of these questions. And by adding these more elements, especially infrastructures representations in, we can see that there is no one point, there is no one process that explains, quote, the state or even the modern state, if we wanna be more specific about this. There are, probably historical moments when we, you can observe something that looks like the modern state across these various things. It would almost certainly be later than most arguments. It would certainly be in the 19th century or late 19th century at the earliest. But nonetheless, it helps us move away from this emphasis on 1648 and Westphalia and things like that. But the, the 19th century is not then a useful point to look for explaining the overall emergence or origins of the state, because some elements of this, some of the ideas, for example, did actually originate in the late medieval period. Some of them have been around longer. Some of them just emerged in the 19th century. So I think thinking, separating that out helps with that. In terms of persist the persistence of the state in the face of challenges today, what I want this idea to this concept to do is to help us identify the ways that the supposedly mysterious persistence of the state, right? There's been since the 1990s and really actually earlier in some ways, there's been a whole series of arguments about how well, the state is surely on the way out. The state is dying. There's globalization, the, the, the multinationalization of capital and production and so on. There's the, um, all the ways that the internet and the politics of the internet cross state boundaries are uncontrollable and so on. Now with this three-part definition, I think we can see that some of these challenges do threaten certain ideas of the state. The idea that there is a state that has a government that is exclusive and complete control over everything goes on within the boundaries is undermined by some of the changes of globalization. However, if we think about infrastructures, we might see, well, maybe the infrastructures of things like the internet actually do undermine some states and strengthen other states. 
A powerful state like the US actually has gained enormous capacity for surveillance and control through its position, somewhat accidental historically, as the hub of the, inter of the global internet. Right, so much traffic goes through the United States that it's given the U.S. these capabilities to observe it and perhaps uh, challenge it in ways that other states don't have. That is, looking at the infrastructure, we can see that that is not threatening the concept of the state. It's changing the way different states have different capabilities rather than undermining the state as a whole. And finally, of course, as many people in this room are, are going to argue during our two-day conference, you know, the map image of the state, in spite of its la inability to capture so much of what's going on, that image remains hegemonic. We still do see that image today. The, one of the, the things I include in my display here is a map of cybersecurity threats. It's so really interesting. The online version, of course, on the website it comes from is a live view of various sorts of attacks going on. Oh, it's right up here. Thank you, Colin. Um, Really interesting visualization. However, it's underlying logic, and it's you know it's gray on black to be very cool and quote cyber. I think that would be the aesthetic they're going for here. The underlying logic is the map of nation state borders. That is how this is visualized with this additional thing on top of it, All right? And that I think shows the power of this representation, not because this representation of state borders is accurate, but actually remains very powerful. It essentially remains hegemonic and that helps maybe help us account for this the supposedly mysterious persistence of the state today. And that brings us to the question of alternatives, right? What organizational form can we think about or talk about that has anywhere near the capacity, resilience, and persistence of the state across all three of these features, right? The internet allows people to organize by sort of community of interest rather than community of geography. That's a powerful undermining of certain ideas of the state, but does that actually threaten the representation of the state as a geographic entity, as the map, world map defined by boundaries? Maybe not. And I'm really excited for the discussions here this week. Whoops. Excited to be better at PowerPoint. Excited for the discussions this week about how so many people in this room are working on much more interesting, different ways of visualizing political forms that might help us challenge this hegemonic vision of the state. It's hard, it's, it's hard for me to imagine because I'm not a very creative map maker for one, but something else that would be able to challenge that hegemony of the mapped image of the state, not just in capturing something different, but doing so in a way that is as convincing and evocative and sort of effectively pleasing to people as the way the mapped Im map image of the world has been because we're, we're maybe because we're so socialized in it through the schoolroom map and things like that. So I'm very interested in discussion to think about this. I'm interested in, in discussions of this concept, again, which I'm not proposing as saying, okay, we should throw out all definitions of the state, this is the one we should use. It's really just a question of what might be a useful new questions we might ask or slightly different ways to address the questions we have about the state's emergence, persistence, and alternatives if we think about infrastructures and representations as being just as much a part of the state as those core ideas of sovereignty and territory and supremacy and so on. Um, and I'm certainly interested in the kind of visualizations that people in this room are doing about this. Finally, just to wrap up, and this is what everybody does, I think, at least if you're like me, when you read other contributions to a conference, as you say, these are all perfect examples of what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> so these are just a couple of them. I mean, this uh, from uh, Barbara Mundi's talk, the map of Tenochtitlan, uh, uh, printed in Europe, based on a drawing brought back by Cortez or one of his, uh, sent back from Cortez or one of his crew, and she'll talk about this in detail. But part of the story of this is about maps of Aztec sovereignty being literally handed over. And to, on the one hand, we can read that as, well, this is sort of a symbol of the change in sovereignty. But what if that is actually part of the actual change in authority and control of this state or state-like entity of the time? And on the right is a map I just pulled from Wikipedia of the federal road networks of Russia. Uh, I think uh, Frank in his, in his video, at least in his paper, talks about how Russian sovereignty is sort of hub and spoke. He talks about this as an idea, and he talks about how the map, the road, how the roads kind of show this. Well, I think the map here, the roads actually are part of that hub and spoke sovereignty, right? They instantiate it. And then a map of that, which this is this is from Wikipedia, but I'm sure there are maps distributed by the Russian government of its federal highway system. That representation is also part of that, right? Highlighting certain areas, drawing them as literally visually more connected to Moscow. And then finally, bottom left is from uh, Luca Schultz's paper, a map he's created, or someone else, no, this is not what this one, someone else created, but a modern map of trying to depict different types of claims. This is over road uh, customs controls, I believe, in the Holy Roman Empire. This vastly complex entity, and obviously this is a modern representation, but that infrastructure of control over passage of goods and people 
is not just sort of like a tool of the power of those authorities, but is part of that authority. That's the infrastructure of that. So those are some things I think are just interesting, fun ways to rethink some of the stuff I read for this conference, but I was very excited to do. So thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over time and I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to join this conference. Uh, I would have loved to join in person. Unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to do that. So I'm sending a recording. Thank you very much, Karen and uh, my team, for inviting me. I, I, I look, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, to comment on that and the comments we have in the session. At the end of the Cold War, there were fewer than a dozen border walls worldwide. There are 74 as of today, with at least 15 others at some stage of planning. This is by now a cliche opening sentence, using countless books on borders. Yet it remains an important symptom of global forms of nativist populism and growing economic disparities. In fact, the number of border walls has grown even further since 2016, with the election of Donald Trump in the United States, the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom, as well as the rise and consolidation of autocratic regimes in Europe, China, Russia, Turkey, India, and Spain. Far from abating, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought further national entrenchments, including in states within the European Union. And yet, this familiar jigsaw-like political geography seems increasingly detached from the realities of border management. Recent literature on migration has drawn attention to the cross-state schemes seeking to keep unwanted migrants at bay. The United States, the European Union, Canada, and Australia in particular, have developed strategies to block, funnel, and filter outsiders, outsourcing operations, setting up offshore naval bases or territories, and even weaponizing terrain itself. Border crossings of all kinds have become a staggered process, involving airline check-ins, of embarkation and disembarkation, and transit areas before the actual border is reached. In order to account for the non-linearity, non-homogeneity, and non-continuity of political borders, terms such as unbundled, flexible, eternal, graduated, and variegated have been coined by social science and political scholars as hyphenated qualifiers of sovereignty. While these forms of modified sovereignty are useful to unpack the spatial formation of neoliberal economies, interpreting territorial discontinuities as exceptions reinforces in effect the Westphalian model as the norm. The very fact that we continually refer to them as exceptions is at the core of my argument. It speaks on the one hand to our attunement as scholars to the entanglement and spatial complexities of a modern state that is always less and always more than what appears on the map. But it also betrays the enduring visual force of political cartography of a needs arrangement of discrete entities with no gaps or overlaps, ultimately indexing a lack in our capacity to imagine other forms of spatial belonging. These two somewhat contradictory views, the Westphalian model of territorial sovereignty is one we are effectively invested in, yet one we recommend as a myth, constitute what I would describe here as a breach. Critical cartographers and historians have convincingly argued that the map preceded the territory. And they have shown that imperial maps in particular played a key role in colonizing new territories by portraying ahead of actual exploration entire continents as blank spaces, or alternatively, as places inhabited by monsters or fantastical creatures. We are now witnessing an important reversal. The territory has largely caught up in the map, and it is the map, having lost its earlier promissory role, that is now struggling to keep up with the territory. In this paper, I examine the limits of cartographic representability with regard to the three core tenets of territorial sovereignty, containment, homogeneity, and contiguity. Exploring each of these in turn, I suggest in the short conclusion that but our attempts at representing national territory may need to be jettisoned altogether in order to open up spaces of belonging organized in alternative ways. The fact that modern state sovereignty is conceptualized as even the opposite of a legally demarcated territory 
has led to an emphasis on edges. And has turned on its head the previous conceptualization of the national space as radiating outwards from the center. Disputes over tiny, economically insignificant, and frequently uninhabitable pieces of real estate are thus a modern phenomenon that would have been incomprehensible before the advent of the map. If governments continue to ensure that all corners of the state, no matter, no matter how remote, fall under their control, perhaps more telling is the ways in which the map is also being modified in line with changes in the geography. Italy's northern border with Austria and Switzerland follows a watershed that separates the drainage basins of northern and southern Europe. Running at high altitudes, the border crosses snowfields and perennial glaciers, all of which are now melting as a result of anthropogenic climate change. As the watershed shifts, so does the border, contradicting its representation on official maps. Italy, Austria, and Switzerland have consequently introduced a novel legal concept of the moving border, one that acknowledges the volatility of geographical features once thought to be stable. A grid of 25 solar powered sensors has been fitted on the surface of the glacier at the, at the, foot, at the foot of Mount Similaun, and every two hours these sensors record data allowing for an automated mapping of the shifts in the border. In this particular border context, technology aims to close the gap between physical reality and representation between map and territory. The promissory role of sensors tracking borders in real time, or drones surveilling spaces beyond human reach, assuages cartographic anxieties and maintains the totalizing fiction of the nation state in suspended belief. The more precise and sophisticated these technologies, the more ontologically secure the borders, ever more detailed and accurate, inching toward an isomorphic relation between the map and reality. These attempts, however, betray an imaginary of the territory that is two-dimensional. Such partial representations are really inadequate to represent spaces beyond the horizontal, yet forays into volumetric space are increasingly becoming routine. The definition and control of volumetric sovereignty and constant evolution, partly because of the, partly through the possibilities afforded by the new technologies, but partly because they are relatively new questions. The notion of airspace sovereignty, for, for example, was recognized just after World War I as a reaction to aerial bombings, or the concept of territorial waters in existence since the late 18th century and generally limited to three nautical miles began to be challenged in the 1940s. More recently, the notion of continental shelf has provided coastal states with further possibilities to extend their sovereign rights beyond the exclusive economic zone in ways that are complex, non-linear, and incomplete. Especially significant is the materiality of that space beyond the terrestrial, air, water, ice, which challenge traditional forms of containment. Yet incursions into those realms are often conceptualized and managed through a land-based imaginary. In 2016, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan launched a visual campaign about its disputed borders. The poster, entitled Do You Know the Shape of Japan? highlights three points of tension, the Northern Territories, Takishima, and Senkaku Islands disputed with Russia, Korea, and China, respectively. This bold visual statement came shortly after Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's victory in died elections, and symptomatic of his vow to free Japan from the fetters of the past. But what is truly radical about this map is less the territorial claim that it stakes than the confident demarcation of a hydro-territorial entity neatly defined against an undifferentiated background. The same outline had previously been published on the ministry's website. However, the online representation nearly traces the extent of J Japan's territorial waters. The poster's bloated logo map, by contrast, distinguishes between Japanese and non-Japanese waters and gives equal weight visually to both land and sea. In his conclusion to the cartographic state, 
Jordan branch wonders whether new representations can be devised to analyze emergent pluriterritorial, polycentric, and multi-scalar geographies of globalization. And the spatial and the spatial remit of this question may be expanded here to include three-dimensional territorial incursions beyond the terrestrial. In fact, through explicitly pedagog pedagogical means, the Japanese poster seeks to do precisely that and to foster effective attachment to these more than human geographies. Jordan Branch suggests convincingly that alternative representations may prove too abstract to build new notions of identity, community, or authority, unlike classic political maps with a clean linear boundaries and homogeneously colored spaces. The second core tenet of modern territorial sovereignty is that it should be homogenous. I am reminded here of Lauren Benton's point that European empires appeared on maps as territories in the same color as their metropolitan centers. Yet imperial space was, I quote, the fabric that was full of holes stitched together out of pieces, a tangle of strings, politically fragmented, legally differentiated, and encased in irregular, porous, and sometimes undefined borders. Benton suggests that a more accurate representation of imperial power, which shall tangle and interrupted European claimed spaces, and would represent, perhaps in colors of varying intensity, the changing and locally differentiated qualities of rule within geographic zones. Her point remains largely valid, perhaps even more so, in today's neoliberal landscape, including in federal, i.e. less centralized, and democratic, or at least democracy, democracy adjacent countries like the United States. The US border zone, for instance, is a thick ribbon, very much unlike the thin abstract line that appears on maps. It extends 100 miles inland, thus completely enclosing a number of states such as Florida and New York, as well as substantial portions of the most densely populated states, California. Within in fact, nine of the 10 largest US metropolitan areas fall within this area. Within the border zone, federal regulations give US Customs and Border Protection extended authority to conduct random and arbitrary stops and searches over, in effect, roughly two thirds of the United States population. The situation in the United States is, in fact, very complex. With the existence of various kinds of territories, classified as organized or unorganized, incorporated or unincorporated, denoting varying degrees of integration, political representation, and citizenship rights. For instance, people born in American Samoa, an unorganized and un unincorporated territory, are US nationals, but not US citizens, nor in fact citizens of any country. On special economic zones and corridors to territories that states control but do not have sovereignty over, such as the United States with respect to Guantanamo Bay, and from territories and dependencies where citizens have fewer rights, like Puerto Rico, to islands where the strict religious rules of the mainland do not apply, such as Iran's Kish Island, that these are some of the countless folds and kinks in the state's spatial fabric imagined to be and idealized as homogenous. Distortions, these torsions and distortions are spatial but also temporal. Various spatial derogations have been granted on a temporary basis, like when the Scottish court was established in the Netherlands on neutral grounds, with the explicit aim to rule on the trial of two Libyans in connection with the Lockerbie bombing of Panam Flight 103. The more unusual case was Suite 212 at Claridge's Hotel in London, the temporary Yugoslavian enclave that was created for a single day in 1945 to ensure the heir of the throne would be born on Yugoslavian soil. Closely linked to containment is the importance of contiguity, specifically that national territory should be at least ideally singular and unbroken. Like containment discussed above, this is a modern concept which would have been, which would have had very little meaning prior to the Treaty of Westphalia. Indeed, medieval Europe had a very different geography. Land titles were exchanged freely between noblemen, resulting in numerous zones of exceptions 
gaps and enclaves. By the 18th century, geographer Alistair Bonnet writes, enclaves were being seen as a problem and the rational world of the Enlightenment tried to sponge away the dark and unmanageable world of enclaves. Of the enclaves still in existence in Europe, the most extensive and convoluted one is the enclave complex of Bader and Bader Nassau. Two towns enmeshed into a single urban entity across the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. On a total area of 32 square miles, the two towns are intertwined into one another. Situated only three miles away from the Belgian mainland, the Belgian town of Bader Hertog is, is made up of 22 exclaves, with the remaining territory around it forming the Dutch town of Bader Nassau. Some of the enclaves are truly minuscule, no larger than 3,000 square yards. This territorial jigsaw is compounded by the irregularity of the shapes of the enclaves themselves, with borderline slicing up acidly across fields, streets, office buildings, and private homes. If Bali residents have quite successfully used these enclaves to market the town for tourist purposes, daily life in enclaves elsewhere in the world is often less benign. In Central Asia, the enclaves across the previous Uzbek border in particular have caused political friction over the use and distribution of water. The world's largest enclave complex was located until 2015 across the India-Bangladesh border. It consisted of one of 102 Indian enclaves on Bangladesh territory and of 71 Bangladeshi enclaves within India's mainland. After decades of attempts at resolution, the government of India and Bangladesh finally announced their intention to resolve the issue through a land swap, giving residents the choice of nationality. While the resolution was largely prompted by the considerable human suffering they caused, as well as the difficulties for both states to administer such Levantine geography, there was also the sense that the enclaves were anachronistic and that both India and Bangladesh needed to regularize their border to become fully aligned on modern models. In comparison, Bala is more like a curiosity within a European Union that is increasingly uniformly managed. Sharing a currency, a language, and most of their laws, the two towns offer, offer their residents very similar daily, daily experiences. But even benign cases such as these annoy people. A few years ago, after a public presentation I had just given on the enclave complex of Bala Herto, Bala Nasa, a member of the audience explained over drinks that the talk had been interesting, but had made him angry. Why do they still have this mess? Why can't they sort it out? I hate it. Clearly, enclaves jar with the, with the cartography to which we have become accustomed. And there is a strong sense that these atomized geographies have no place in modern political geography. Interestingly, a too regular outline is also, is also seen as problematic lacking personality, or as the unfortunate outcome of colonization. France and Texas appear to be two examples of prototypical logo maps. Both are used extensively as logos and as units of measure, such as such and such country being X times the size of Texas or France. They are both balanced in terms of weight, fitting neatly within a circle. Much has been written in particular about France and its regular shape, approximating a hexagon. In Cartophilia, Tatiana Dunlop notes that the hexagonal form created a public perception of France, France's authentic national shape as preordained and almost God given in its mathematical perfection, giving the French a strategic strategy for arguing against the ethnic and linguistic justifications for national borders that other Europeans have embraced. What these ideal representations leave out, of course, is France's vast former colonies and overseas possessions. France's spatially neat hexagon is only the tip of the spatial iceberg that a country will constitute. Its numerous overseas territories, or dum dum, make the country a truly global entity with a territorial footprint accounting for 18% of the mainland's territory and with an exclusive economic zone, representing 96.7% of the total. Even fragments closer to the mainland and fully integrated in terms of sovereignty 
very fragile visual relationship to the state to which they are attached. Corsica, a few miles of France's southern coastline, and usually <laughs> including the new local map, is absent from the graphic imaginary of the hexagon. Similar to diacritics, the relationship of fragments to their continental state feels additive and impermanent. A quick Google search for images of the USA logo map brings up outlines of the mainland without Alaska or Hawaii. In the rare instances where the two states are included, it often feels like an afterthought. Reduced in size, they are tucked in where space allows. Visual representation matters. When territories are left out, they fall out of mind. The fact that the United States outline never includes distant territories, such as American Samoa or Guam, has repercussions in, on the place of these territories in American consciousness. In his study of the United States dependent territories, Doug Mack makes a German point. He argues that the very imaginary of America, which relies so heavily on the troubled states, makes territories invisible and ultimately forgettable. These unrepresented and unrepresentable spaces also challenge the Westphalian ideal of jigsaw-like entities, their homogeneous colors and shapes that neatly fit together without gaps or overlap. If the gap between map and territory, and territory is not novel, what I have suggested in this paper is that it is widening to the point of having created two irreconcilable spatial imaginaries. There are attempts, as I've shown in the case of Japan's terracious map, to integrate into the logo map spaces found beyond, beyond human experience. And we can anticipate further attempts at volumizing the logo map. Even in the unlikely event these enlargement projects are successful and citizens do develop patriotic sentiments for maritime and aerial terrains, future swarm-like formations and incursions into spaces found beyond, beyond human perception or scale ultimately make these attempts futile. Rather than see enclaves and exclaves, non-contiguous states, free trade corridors and special economic zones as exceptions, it might be preferable to embrace spatial discontinuities as a more realistic model of territorial sovereignty. Benjamin Bratton draws attention to the ways in which the internet is emerging as a living, quasi-autonomous, transterritorial civil society that produces, defends, and demands rights on its own beyond the body of the state. This does not portend the insist on the demise of the state, but does imply its ongoing redefinition in relation to network geographies that it can neither contain nor be contained by. Bratton envisions, for instance, the possible scenario of a quasi-state actor, religious polity or cloud platform, offering more secure levels of digital identity than the state, leading to the coexistence of overlapping realms of sovereignty, national, political, economic, fiscal, etc., in ways that resemble the pre westphalian order. In such a scenario, attempts at bringing cartographic and especially logographic representations in line with the state appear particularly futile. It is perhaps an opportune time to define alternatives, especially since local maps are inevitably incomplete in leaving out islands, territories, and territorial fragments, and also misleading with their usual colors. Here, the case of the United Kingdom might serve a useful example. In addition to the difficulty representing the state as the logo map, given that it involves various legal entities, both within the state and adjacent to it, such as Crown Dependencies, or Yellow Man, Guernsey and Jersey, Guernsey and Jersey, overseas territories and Commonwealth realms, the UK's own territorial arrangement of four components, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, across two main islands, adds further complexity. Perhaps, out of a reluctance to split Ireland, the UK rarely uses logo map, opting instead for a flag. Not only this rupture between territory and sovereignty does not appear to have weakened national attachment, but the very non-territorial representation is in fact more inclusive, since it is no longer making claims to geographical accuracy, 
we can see similar incipient development aspects, notably with the French hexagon, represented in more abstract ways in the colors of the flag. Unlike a logo map aligned on an ideal of territorial container, these abstract logos suggest membership to a more geographically malleable entity. To what extent these efforts will lead to transformations in the imaginary of the state is purely to tell. All right, we have a good 15 minutes and if we want it, we can take a little extra for questions. So Martin and I both have microphones. If anyone would like to pose a question, clearly the only speaker who's in the room who can directly answer is Jordan, but this session is being recorded. Franck Pierre will be able to access it later. And he has my email and I have many of your emails. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to articulate them in any case. Okay. Uh, my question is for Jordan. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I, uh, I especially appreciated the point that the state doesn't emerge at one moment um, and there isn't a single causal factor for it. And in addition to that, this uh, effort to, to rethink certain aspects of the state. I had um, a bit of a hesitation with, uh, with the emphasis on ideas and representation because of what I see as uh, the effacement of class power in the histories of the states. Uh, so I was wondering um, what role class power plays in both ideas and representations because certain people have access to the resources that allow them to determine those things. Other people have are, are, are well placed in order to be able to act on them. So I was just wondering what role class power plays in this conception of the state. Thank you. Should I just go ahead and answer it? Okay. That's, thanks, that's a great question. So I, I had not thought about that directly, but I what I'd like to, the, you know, the, my point of this concept is to say, okay, let's take some arguments, like there are arguments about class processes and the emergence of the state. I mean, Perry Anderson sort of traces this medieval to capitalist uh, transition, lots of others. Um, would be, it'd be interesting to look at each of these factors. And like you said, representations of the politics of representation are, you can see all kinds of class dynamics in that and who gets to not just produce them, but reproduce, distribute, sort of make certain representations hegemonic. And part of the origins of the modern political map are about that. Right, or about a class of consumers consuming these, you know, uh, beautiful objects, not really practically useful. I mean, a lot of the historical maps around them would not have been practically useful for navigation or something, but they're consumed as part of their sort of class role as, you know, elites. Um, and you could say the same thing about infrastructures. Who was able to, to, to build and make infrastructures? Think about 19th century telegraph as an infrastructure of the state and other political communication. Well, you know, there's these sort of, uh, I think, uh, tired arguments of the of telegraph as the Victorian internet, so to speak, but it is fundamentally different. I mean, the digital divide of the last 20 years is nothing compared to who was able to send even a five word telegraph in the 19th century. So it could be each of those parts actually could be, it would be an interesting way to rethink and think through a lot of those class dynamics and see how they overlap, right? See how the, the redefinition of representations builds on different class access to infrastructures of distributing those and also in the realm of ideas too. I think there's a lot of discussion about class dynamics in the sort of history of political thought. That's not directly my area, but I think people have explored that. But again, it'd be connecting those is what I'd like to do. But thank you, that's a great point. I mean, this, it's one of the many things that could overarch across these that I didn't really talk about. Okay, we have a question back here. And why don't you introduce yourself first? I'm gonna hold the mic. I'm Michael Dalby, hello. That's a great talk. Let me sharpen the point just a, a bit. Is not global capitalism an emergent state by your definition, or is it some kind of dual property, like uh, an alternative way of conceptualizing power and influence? Yeah, it's a great. I think, and that that is the question about a lot of the alternatives, and we and like global capitalism is a great example. And most of us don't think of that as a positive alternative to the state necessarily, right? Some of the discussion of alternatives is like the state is a mess. We should have something that's better. But there are plenty of examples of things that are maybe not great, but there are there could think of as alternative organizations. And what I think is interesting is a lot of them are sort of presented as and maybe maybe convincingly layered on top of the system of, of states today. Right. Global capitalism is something that exists globally, mostly globally, 
it works through this through state power. It changes state power, undermines it in some ways. It reinforces some states' power. Um, is it a political organization in the same way? I think in some sense it does. It does. You know, politics is about distribution of of scarce resources, and that's what global capitalism does. I mean, uh, Frank's point at the end about I don't know if you're familiar with this book by Benjamin Bratton called The Stack. It's about this sort of this proposal of a that there's a global mega structure that's emerging out of the internet. That's another interesting effort to say there's something else that is emerging that is not like oh, here, I'm this new thing and I'm going to push the state out, but is existing on top of it. I think all of these things we thought about. Now, global capitalism, sorry, I just keep going on one question, but this is a great question. I would love to think through global capitalism through these three categories as well. There's ideas about capitalism, neoliberal ideas, the idea of the inevitability of comparative advantage and free trade, but there's also infrastructures, right? I mean, when you have new political actors, like when Trump was elected in the US, he's, you know, I'm going to put up walls, I'm going to impose tariffs, Oh, this is the end of the liberal economic order. Well, containerized shipping took decades to build up an enormous complex infrastructure. It went nowhere, right? It persisted. Shipping can, is containerized. We've seen the problems with that in the COVID uh, shipping shortage, but like the infrastructures of global capitalism may be more persistent than policies that some people think, well, if we just change policies, we would sort of change the global economic system. So thinking through a vast sort of institution like global capitalism through these categories might also highlight some ways that it has maybe more, I think, um, more capacities than we might think about. But that's another a great sort of, again, all these questions I'm answering by saying, yeah, I'd love to rethink that through this concept, but that's kind of how I, how I see it. Uh, I have a question from our Zoom participants. It's actually from Peter Ball mm -hmm. and uh, related to what you've just been talking about, but sort of at a different scale. His, his question is, I wonder if your analytic framework would apply equally well to a university. If so, what makes the state different? Yeah. So I would love to think about any sort, any level of institution through the ideas, infrastructures, representations that make it, it's it, a thing. And so that's a great, I mean, the, the, you know, Weber's point about the state was that, that, that passage I quoted, the italicized part is about the claim, monopoly on the claim to use, use legitimate force, successful monopoly, right? And he does that, he claims that because he's differentiating the state from other forms of political organization that are human communities that are organized in certain ways, but don't have that monopoly. So obviously there are different political organizations that have different capacities, but I mean, I think infrastructures are full. I mean, universities are full of infrastructures and representations and logos and um, you know, recognizing the, the, the land that Stanford sits upon is, is one of those acts of sort of the university reproducing itself in a different way. So that's a great question. I wish Peter was here, I could talk to him personally. Hi there, um, Bill Rankin, uh, thanks for the paper. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit about the kind of disciplinary specificity of wh where the paper is coming from. Um, I think you mentioned this in the in the written drafts that this is something that uh, fellow political scientists don't aren't comfortable with, or this is a, a news to them. And I think about how, um, like you said, with 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 Tong Chai's work and many others afterwards, the idea that the state has a representational aspect to it is is a robust literature on that. Um, I think about infrastructure as well. Charlie Mayer's work on this. There's a whole sub subfield of infrastructure studies uh, that makes you know that that point about the the way that large technical systems um, are the thing that creates territoriality. Um, and I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a sense of why this is uh, not part of political science. Um, basically, like, why is this? Why is this news um, to people who, in fact, spend their whole lives studying the state? Um, what is the what is the sort of the ongoing commitment to um, the the idea of state as idea or in the intellectual history of the state um, in 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 political science? Wow. Okay, I saw Bill rank his hand. I knew it was going to be the tough one. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person and talking today. Um, yeah, I don't have a great defense of my field on a lot of this stuff. Um, I think that there is. You know, a lot of discussion of the state came out of the political theory and political philosophy side of political science. And so sort of that that's focused on ideas and texts and language and discussions. Um, it's hard to break this other stuff into political science. It just is. I mean, there's a huge literature on science technology studies and how can we apply this to, to political science? And there are people that have written really fascinating books that go almost entirely unsighted by political scientists about this exact thing. Um, I mean, there's obviously disciplinary gatekeeping and things like that going on. I think what's really what I want to do here 
is to say something that hopefully will also at least not just be completely just repeating at a much more, uh, let's say, less um, interesting level way, the work of people in STS and uh, the people on large technological systems. Because what, what I want to argue is unlike what, what Mayer says, which is really about, implicitly at least, about infrastructural systems creating the state. And so they're just sort of like in terms of diagramming out the logic of an argument, we're saying there's infrastructure systems and there's the state and there's some kind of arrow going from one to the other. And I just want us to take that arrow out and say those infrastructure systems, if they are part of the state, what does that say about the origins of this whole thing? And that, I think that's a little bit different and it's a little closer, although it doesn't go again, go as far as Latour and others like that, that are saying, well, it's all in the files, it's all in the actor network and the hum, non-human actants and this kind of stuff. Um, I'm not interested in going that far because then I, no one in my field will listen to me at all. And that's not my goal either. But I think there's just, there's a lot of inertia around certain ways of defining things. And political, if you think more, if there's more broadly, anybody who's sort of taken political science classes, not just talking about the state, but about political institutions. There's a whole debate in political science about what's an institution, and there's a variety of definitions, but they all are about ideas in some ways. It's about formal institutions and rules. It's about informal rules. It's about shared norms. Those are all ideas. And we always say, oh, you know, in the UN, it's not those buildings. There's buildings, you know, the UN has buildings, it's an institution, but it's not those buildings. It's the UN, it's this institution. There's other institutions that don't have buildings, so we can't leave that out. But I think we include both. And the UN is an institution that has a whole host of ideas and also has a whole host of physical infrastructures and representations. I don't have a great defense, but you know, the nice part about getting tenure recently is I don't have to defend my field anymore and I can just, just talk about what I want. So thank you. Oh, thank you. You have, okay, so I can't have it. Thank you, and I, I loved your written paper as well. It was so informative and lucid. Um, this, is, this kind of knits together the two questions about class and global capitalism. And I think when you introduce the idea of, of representation, we all think everything will be able to be represented and visible in some camp. And I wonder if a protective category would be that which is invisible mm. or suppressed from representation as actually part of the politics of representation, because that kind of allows you into those questions of class, global capitalism, and how, for instance, in the evocation of orders, um, we often have the, the, the dispossessed, i.e. illegal immigrants as being represented to police orders, but we never have kind of global capitalists who, who transcend national borders. So I'm wondering if kind of the, the invisible or unable to be represented could be productive in thinking yeah. of this schema. And if so, like what happens? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, great suggestion. I don't have an answer on top of my head, but I think it's really interesting to think about because, you know, there are ways that the state represents itself. And we were talking at lunch about, you know, uh, asking students to map what their college a map their college either could not make because it's about student experience, things that college doesn't know, or that the college would would not make because it's embarrassing facts about its history and so on. And so representations are are, are choices and they're, they're choices that get embedded in, but I think, yeah, so then that allows the state to reproduce itself with a certain narrative by what it chooses to represent. I mean, invisibility versus visible is a whole interesting discussion from anthropology about infrastructures too, right? There's one side that says infrastructures are those things that we don't think about until they break because they're invisible. That's the kind of like developed world infrastructure. I mean, nobody thought about containerized shipping except a few weirdos like me until two years ago. And then there's in the developing world where infrastructure serve an entirely symbolic purpose. They don't actually accomplish much practically, but they show state power and authority and strength and so on by being these big built things. And so that visibility would be an really interesting thing to explore as well. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to, <laughs> okay. You... <laughs> So, uh, Alberto Diaz Calleros, I'm here at Stanford. I'm a political scientist, actually, but I'm not going to defend our profession. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do have a question about, you know, your infrastructure concepts. So it, it is not clear to me how much infrastructure you need to be able to talk about that as a meaningful concept. So I'm thinking about the U.S.-Mexico border. So Raymond Crave's book would tell us, you know, they drew the line and that was it. There's this beautiful book also, A Line in the Sand. That's all it is. There's nothing really there. And uh, you then turn it into maps with the cartographic commission in the 1900s. They put the borders and those are in these big wooden boxes. 
those maps say this is the border, but the river can shift. Uh, and then, you know, a wall, I mean, Trump did not invent it. It was done before. It seems to me that infrastructure doesn't matter. I, I mean, it, I'm trying to be provocative here and, and, and it goes against what I would say as a political scientist, but you know, does it matter to say that there's infrastructure in that border? Yeah, that's a great point. So what I would, I would wanna argue in return is that it absolutely matters because that border is different. Right, and, it, and we should recognize that difference, incorporate that difference into the idea of what is the territorial aspect of the United States state, the state of the US, right? And it's different in an era of totally un, even undelimited borders, and it's different in an era once borders are demarcated, but largely open, and it's different in an era with those material infrastructures of control. And the infrastructures matter. I think about you know the border I grew up being familiar with growing up in San Diego, which is the U.S. the San Diego Tijuana border, where you know in the '90s there was uh, there were, all the infrastructure was there, but it was not had not been sort of turned on in the same way until after 9/11, and then on and on. I mean, you know, going back and forth was you know I had there were people in my high school who who lived in Tijuana and, and came to the school in the United States because it was doable, right? And so that's a very different world from the '50s when you know my grandmother was talking about just going down to Tijuana for lunch or something, just whatever. You know, it was like you didn't even know you're going to another country necessarily, except it was different and better food. And that's so different from today when the infrastructure has been hardened, but in that area, it hasn't the interest, the physical infrastructure hasn't changed, it's the use of it. So I would say that that's, that's a good illustration of why when we say, well, the United States is this territorially delimited entity and it, in ideas, it's been the same since you know, the early US. The US is the, was founded on this very territorial boundary uh, surveyed idea, but it actually is a different institution today. And it's not just that, oh, it has different effects and it's hard for people to move. No, no, the institution itself is different. And then that has important consequences for mobility and migration and people's you know, human life that people that had built lives crossing borders and so on. But yeah, that, I think that's, a, I don't have a great answer to that, but that's a, that's a great provocation. Thank you. Hi, Jordan, this is Marie Price. Um, I was struck by your ideas of representation and I wanted you to speculate a little bit how uh, digital technology is changing that and the fact that if you use Google Maps in India, you're going to see a different representation of the state than if you were, say, in Pakistan doing the same. And yeah. how does that, this intentional um, differentiation based on where you are, um, impact the idea of sovereignty, do you think, and yeah. feed on it and make it more complex and alternative? It's, a, I mean, that the what Google Maps does is a fascinating story of his. I've talked to people there who are there's someone who's a geopolitical advisor to Google Maps, which sounds like a fun job. Um, it's all about customer service, right? Well, our customers are in, in India and they want to see the Indian names. The customer of Pakistan wants to see Pakistan names. Indian government won't let you distribute unless you show Kashmir as being entirely in India. Um, the malleability, though, is what's, what's interesting is that it, it can appear the same. Everybody thinks they're getting the one version when they're not. I mean, I actually think Google Maps, just all those, uh, most digital mapping platforms, I mean, I'm interested in hearing what Bill has said, but it's because he's a lot more intelligent things to say about this, but it really is the, the, the peak of modern cartography. I mean, the one-to-one, -one, you could, in theory, you could zoom a digital map down to be one-to-one. -one. It wouldn't be very useful. Maybe a screen this big, at least you could see what your bedroom looks like in one-to-one -one scale, right? But that's like, that was the dream. And it just sort of, it's still built on the same thing. I mean, Bill has great arguments about the, the, the geolocational and the and GPS and how that is built, you know, made non-local knowledge even less important than the way that non-local, or actually even more important, non-local knowledge can take even more precedence than it ever has. But I think that kind of malleability doesn't necessarily change sovereignty. It changes, I mean, it, it relocates some of the power of representation, thinking about class away from governments to the global capitalist elite, even more directly in these sort of corporate Thing. So that would be about representation. Now, the interesting thing is because the co company has a goal of profit maximization, it's not interested in imposing just one view. It's happy to show multiple views as long as they keep everybody buying the, the product. And it's not a great answer for that, but I think it, it's an interesting overlap that's a little different. Well, thank you very much, both to our speakers and to our audience. This has, I hope, been a sample of what is to come.